Hi, I'm Nick Sider. I'm a research assistant professor of field crop entomology at U of I. Today we're going to talk about corn rootworm, uh, both western and northern corn rootworm in Illinois, and some of the considerations we should make for management going into 2020. Corn rootworm's been with us for many years in Illinois. It's the most important insect pest of field crops that we have. Um, this is an insect that has one generation per year, and they're going to spend the winter as eggs buried in the soil. Those eggs are going to hatch in around late May, early June, really around the same time that uh, fireflies are emerging. So when you start to see fireflies out there, uh, you'll know that the rootworm eggs are beginning to hatch. The larvae are going to go through three instars where they feed on corn, and then the adults will begin emerging in July. You know, one of the consequences of this timeline is that we have to implement any control measures for this insect, whether it's a BT hybrid or a soil insecticide. That decision has to be made at planting, or made prior to planting and implemented at planting. Um, in terms of the host plants that this insect has, uh, the larvae are strictly going to develop on corn roots. Uh, the adults will feed on pollen from corn as well as a variety of other sources. Um, they'll feed on foliage in some cases. They'll feed on cucurbits. Uh, northern corn rootworm will feed on giant ragweed and other sources of pollen in addition to corn pollen. Um, and in terms of the damage that they will cause, the, the first instar larvae are going to hatch and feed on the root hairs, and then the, the later instars will feed inside of the corn roots um, and ultimately they're going to prune that root. Um, in terms of the two different species, the, the biggest difference that we have biologically is the way that they're able to overcome crop rotation as a control tactic in Illinois. With the western corn rootworm, our more common species, uh, females will lay eggs in soybean and other plants in addition to corn and those eggs can then hatch into corn that's grown in rotation with soybean or another crop the previous year. With northern corn rootworm, uh, those insects will lay their eggs in corn and then the eggs can remain dormant for one, two, three, or four winters. Therefore, a certain proportion of them are going to hatch into corn, um, even if it's grown in rotation two years later in that same field. And the consequence of this is when you have a northern corn rootworm population in your field, that's a population that you have to follow for several years. It's not just a one-year um, situation. Now, in terms of the damage that corn rootworm can cause, uh, these are two examples of very heavily damaged plants. Uh, obviously, this is a bad scenario for that plant. Um, leads to reduced water and nutrient uptake um, and ultimately reduced yield. Uh, in addition to that reduced nutrient uptake, you have the potential for lodging. Um, you have the potential for that plant to fall over uh, because it doesn't have enough root mass to support it. One of the biggest issues we faced with corn rootworm in recent years is the potential for resistance to the BT traits that we currently use to control them in Illinois. And currently in the state, we have resistance or partial resistance to what we call the CRY3 traits. That's the yield guard trait, the, the agrisure rootworm trait, and the agrisure duracade trait. That resistance is fairly common uh, throughout Illinois. It's fairly easy to find in most of the rootworm areas of the state. We also have another trait, the, the Herculex corn rootworm trait. Um, and resistance to that has been found in northeastern Iowa in a limited area, and reduced susceptibility has been found in Illinois, but it's not nearly as widespread as resistant to those other traits. Now, typically, we're going to employ these traits not as a single trait anymore in our hybrids, but as a pyramided trait that includes one of the, the CRY3 traits and CRY 34, 35. That's what most of our trait packages are in Illinois currently. So our pyramided trait packages are still performing well in Illinois for the most part, and that includes trait packages like Smart Stacks, uh, several Agrisure trait packages. Um, those are packages that include more than one CRY toxin that target corn rootworm. And there is a table that's been produced, we call it the, the Handy BT Trait Table, that will actually show you what toxins are present in what trait packages that are targeted for corn rootworm control. 
One recent development we've had over the last year is that we've actually, our colleagues have confirmed resistance in the northern corn rootworm uh, to both CRY3435 and CRY3BB1 in North Dakota. And that's a situation that we'll be watching in Illinois very closely um, as we move forward. In terms of our current management recommendations, the best thing that we can do is to implement rootworm control where it's needed based on adult populations the previous year. Overall, our numbers are pretty low in Illinois when you compare them to historical areas. That's not to say there aren't hot spots out there, and ideally we want to have monitoring information, monitor information from our fields to make that determination. You know, we want to monitor adults in July and August to determine whether we need control the following year. Um, we want to make that decision based on our local populations, not just on those overall trends. Um, and in northern Illinois, where we do have high, if we do have high populations of northern corn rootworm, those are fields that we need to follow for multiple years. Um, where control is justified, the most effective option we have currently is a pyramided BT trait. Uh, there are several soil insecticides out there that are still viable. Um, one thing you want to do in your fields in July and August is to go out and evaluate how well your control options are working. Go out and dig some roots from each different type of control that you're putting out there and evaluate them for damage. Um, it's quite a bit of work, but this will show you the level of feeding that you're having and will show you uh, how well your control decisions are paying off um, in terms of controlling that target insect. So where we do have unexpected damage observed or if resistance is expected, you know, the best option that we have is to rotate that field to soybean. That's going to kill all the western corn rootworm in the soil at hatch. Um, those larvae, when they hatch, if there's a soybean plant there, whether it's a rotation-resistant larva or not, they can't feed on soybean roots. So that is going to reduce the overall population. You know, your next best option if you're in a situation where you have resistance to the BT traits is to, to rotate to a soil insecticide. But the worst option, what we really want to avoid doing, is continuous corn in those fields using the same trait package, the same control every year. Um, that's how this de resistance develops. And, you know, ultimately it's no coincidence that the first areas we found resistance to these various traits have been heavy continuous corn areas. And one thing I want to leave you with, with western corn rootworm in particular, we've demonstrated, our colleagues have demonstrated, that local practices have a demonstrated impact on rootworm resistance development. So what you do in your fields uh, is going to affect the type of resistance issues that you have going forward. Uh, so ideally we want to incorporate crop rotation, we want to incorporate multiple levels of control uh, to hopefully preserve these tools going forward.